hand it over to Richard for his talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I'm here to talk to you about why you shouldn't be scared of rebooting and using mutable systems that need a bit more rebooting. So I think everybody knows who I am, but just in case you don't, I'm Richard. I'm a distribution architect at SUSE. Before that, I've been a little bit of everything, customer, QA engineer, open SUSE board member, distribution engineer, you know, doing this for like 20 odd years, and I created uh, Aeon. So the agenda for this morning, I'm gonna be telling you how about all that Linux that we've been doing for 20 years is fundamentally broken. Then talking about actually how most of you already know this and you've been coping with the chaos for so long you might not realize all the steps you've been doing to do with that. And then how kind of immutability swoops in and hopefully makes all our lives easier. So traditional Linux is broken. And if you think about it actually, it makes sense, right? You know, we build it like a Swiss army knife and a Swiss army knife is not the best tool for any job. It can do any job. But you've got all of these different tools crammed together on a, on a little stick, you know, and there's a bunch of compromises made to make all of those things fit together in a Swiss Army knife. That's a traditional Linux distribution. It's the same story. We cram together a whole bunch of services and a whole bunch of features. And because we're all trying to fit it into the same medium, you know, there's a whole bunch of compromises that we have to make to fit it all in there. And even when we do it right, you know, there's increased chances of incompatibilities or complex failures as, you know, one part interacts with another part. Talk more about that later. Because traditional Linux is extremely complicated. I mean, if we look at Tumbleweed, there's currently 15,000 different RPMs in there. So, you know, every time Zipper's doing any dependency resolution, it's got 15,000 possible bits to figure out how they stick together. Flea is even worse, I mean, in some respects, you know, because in that, you know, in that package repo, it's built across 43,000 source RPMs. Every single maintenance update ever for every service pack there and proceeding is all there in the repository, you know, all potentially RPMs that need to then be resolved and put on your machine. You know, and it's just counting source packages when you then actually think of binary packages, you know, this each source package can produce multiple. So these numbers are, are wildly off, but trending higher. And with all of the discussions with ALP and SLFO and all of that stuff, in the architecture team, there's been an effort to kind of, okay, let's think about, the, stop thinking about this on a package by package basis, and let's make it simpler and think of like the groups of components we could possibly start mapping things to, to make things easier for building and managing and shipping. And this is the easiest diagram we came up with, <laughs> where, you know, yeah, you know, no matter how much you try and simplify the problem, you end up with crazy spider webs of endless modules linking to other modules. Yeah, you know, I, uh, yeah, like kernel plus. There's there's one there's one loop somewhere where just GNOME gets involved for no reason that makes any sense to us. But you know, you get rid of the GNOME stack and everything starts falling apart. That's. That's the curse of traditional Linux, as well as the strength, of course, because we do like the fact we can do all these different things on it all at the same time. And then, you know, this complexity just gets more and more layered on top of each other. And I, you know, anyone who's done RPM packaging, you know, sees issues like this OpenSSL example where you know, open SSL3 requires open SSO, which requires open SSL3, and hey, there we go. Now, Zipper does a wonderful job of figuring out these dependency loops and making a decision on its own, you know, which order to install them in. But can you be sure it's always installing the same package in the same order every time? Well, probably not. And if you're not using Zipper, then DNF will probably decide a different order for doing these kind of things. You know, we can't avoid this complexity. This is, this is what life is, but yeah. This complexity brings other problems, which we'll talk about in a bit. And you know, just think about your daily Linux usage. You know, you're running a standard up, you know, you're running a standard tumbleweed or leap machine, and you've got your services running on there, and you've got your, your browser running, and you run regular zipper, and you know, it goes and replaces all of the, the libraries underneath the service, you know, the, the binaries you're currently running. Now, 
especially on Leap, you know, we're not expecting to be doing massive library changes in a, in a maintenance update. But, you know, there's no guarantee, you know, no solid guarantee that every update is going to have all of the libraries there with the same functions, with the same names for your applications to keep happily running on. Which is why you sometimes have a case of, you know, you run Zipper up and then suddenly, you know, some service you had running, like your X session, you know, crashes spectacularly because it's had libraries swapped around underneath it. And same again, actually, when it comes to the binaries themselves. You know, we all see this, up, this message from Zipper every time we do a Zipper up on our, our machines. You know, your system isn't actually secure until you've reloaded the binaries you're running to actually include the updates that you've just downloaded. And how many actually religiously run zipper ps minus a and check the processes and actually restart everything? One, two, three. Every every time, every update, you you do that. Cool. That's that's like three times more than the people at Suzicon when I gave this presentation. So, but yeah, you know, point is most of us don't do it. And if you don't do it, you know, is your system actually well, secure? No. And it's definitely not consistent. You know, if you run another version of the same process, it's going to be running a different version than the last one. Like, weird stuff happens then. And, you know, we keep, always talk about RPMs as packages, like Lego, right? You know, we think of it like these wonderful things that are pre-built in OBS and they're predefined. And, I mean, if, if, you know, with everything Bernard's doing, they are reproducible at least. And, you know, we talk about them like they're self-contained. But they're not. You know, in reality, they are applications in their own right. They can do whatever the heck they want on your system and they're running as root. And they're doing whatever the heck they want every time you install them, or upgrade them, or even uninstall them. So, yeah, there is no limit to their power, you know. And we need it to have that no limit, because we need to be able to do all this funky stuff to do updates properly. But, you know, there's nothing stopping an RPM, besides our good policies and practices and testing, you know, to stop it randomly deleting files, rewriting your configuration, injecting files into your system that aren't actually included in the sources. Every time there's a new system D service, we're doing a system CTL daemon reload. You know, we're quite often restarting system D services as well. All this is running at root while your system's running, while you're trying to have it do other things as well. Weird stuff happens. Just kind of one example of a rather long RPM postscript that's a little bit on the scary side. You know, every time MariaDB gets updated or installed, you know, there's new config written to ETC. Markers get written into the var partition to trigger database upgrades on your next restart. So you restart your service and suddenly it wants to, yeah, it doesn't start, it does a database upgrade instead. And marker files that mention MySQL just get randomly deleted if, if they happen to be in the same place, which I mean, that's fine if you're running this on a system that only has MariaDB, and there is, of course, a package conflict, so you can't install MySQL. But what if you're running, a sh you know, running this against shared storage? That might not be a great behavior. So the only guarantee you really have with RPMs is they can be variable. They can behave differently. Even when we build them reproducibly, they, don't, they aren't necessarily going to run reproducibly. You know, those scripts in those RPMs are going to be, in, yeah, change their behavior based on things like, was this other RPM already installed? Is, is this other binary here? We have a ton of if statements to do that. If this is installed, then do this. You know, what, yeah, what's been uninstalled? What configs are still lying around there? Installation order, you know, some package, yeah. Quite often we do our best to make sure with RPMs to declare, you know, we need this before this, but if we accidentally forget it requires, you can quite easily have an RPM do something totally different depending on which order Zipper decided to install stuff in. You know, are there databases there? Are there configuration there? Are the services actually running? Or really, like, whatever crazy harebrained scheme some developer decided would be a good idea to check when installing this RPM. The most harebrained I can think of was one I did a couple of years ago, which is libcontainers common. So the, the config file, the, the package providing the config files for Podman. And you know, the intention behind this was good. The idea was 
if you're running your containers on BTRFS, we want you using the BTRFS backend, backend in Podman. So every time you do anything with libcontainers-common, it would check what file system is var currently mounted as. And if it's BTRFS, it would go in and change your config to use that. It doesn't care if you've already got containers using the other backend, so suddenly that doesn't work anymore. It doesn't care if var is an NFS mount, and therefore that isn't going to work either. It doesn't care about anything. It just goes in like a boot in a shire shop and messes with your config. Um, we stopped doing this now, but <laughs> like just this week after I wrote these slides, you know, the new maintainers who are doing a much better job with this package moved around where those config files now are. And unfortunately, the way they did it, accidentally wiped, well, accidentally ignored everybody's existing configs. So everybody got the default no matter what they had on their system. Even when we do things better, it's, it's still a mess. Another example that I suffer with on like a semi-weekly basis, um, Botmaster that runs behind almost all the OpenSUSE release infrastructure is running a tool called GoCD. It's a, a Java application doing CIDC pipelines. There's a server, there's agents. All of this is ra uh, running sort of driven by a wrapper which needs headless Java. It's picky about its version numbers. And every time Java is updated on our Leap server, every single Go CD agent suddenly stops working entirely. And every pipeline for Botmaster breaks. Why? Well, every time Java gets updated in a SUSE distribution, of course, that bumps the Java version. You've just updated Java. And of course, Java has its Java home, which mentions the Java version. So the package goes and redefines the Java home variable for everybody. But Go server had already read the previous Java home and initiated itself with the previous Java home and was using that path to call Java to load up all of the other agents and pipelines and everything else. So that gets redefined while the system is running. Every single running Go CD process suddenly can't find its Java because it's no longer there because we've updated it. So we've updated Java and we've managed to actually break everything that was using Java on that system. And it's not a bug. Like everyone here is doing actually everything perfectly right. We've installed a new Java version. We should update the Java home. We've uninstalled the old Java version. We, you know, it's not there for anyone to use it anymore. But it's also like perfectly valid for GoCD to assume that like its Java is not going to just spontaneously disappear while it's running. Like none of the, like, none of the packages are really doing anything wrong here. No, none of the software is really you know should be taking into account this weird behavior. But we've just got complex systems. Even when we do everything 100% right, it ends up causing unplanned chaos. And talking about you know, doing everything right. You know, when you're thinking about distributions like Leap and you know, the SUSE distributions with live patching, you know, a ton of care is taken to mitigate this stuff. You know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, making sure that libraries don't have major version changes, making sure binaries are functionally staying mostly the same. But ultimately, like, they're still RPMs. You know, you're still going to have to update those pro those those binaries processes when when they yeah when it's deployed. It's still going to be running RPM scripts, and you know that's praying that we've done everything to think of every possible variation, and you know that's never going to be 100%. And the same with live patching. You know, yes, cool. Live patching is amazing. You patching the actual function in flow while it's live. We take great care to do it in a way that's, yeah, you know, not going to break anything. That's the whole point. But it's still an RPM. They're still running RPM scripts. We've still had bugs. Interestingly, the only one I know about, again, was caused by me, but we still have bugs with, <laughs> with RPM scripts in live patching that, yeah, running on every single update. And when you think about it, I think most of us who've been using Linux for a while kind of just inherently know that our traditional way of doing packaging and package updates isn't perfect. You know, I think, if you think of actually how people deal with their machine on a daily basis, you know, most of us aren't just YOLO patching and, and thinking about it. Like, so we've got three people who even read the zipper PS minus A updates, you know. And when you think of the trends sort of out there 
in this day and age anyway. You know, on the server side of things, more and more people are doing single-purpose VMs, cloud instances, you know, basically deploying a server to just do one job, minimizing what that server does, you know, the whole premise of never touching a running system or, or having maintenance windows or delaying patching. And then, of course, you know, clustering, having redundant instances, using automation. Like, like these are the, this is the reason why these trends have become trends, because the traditional Linux model is busted. And there's a bunch of benefits of doing this just anyway, you know, right? If you're minimizing the system, having it as a single purpose installation, every VM or every server just doing one job, you know, there's less stuff there to break, there's less components to update, there's less weird interactions you're possibly gonna have between one service doing something perfectly valid that trashes the other service. Less scopes for issues when updating, it's easier to monitor, it's easier to debug, it's easier to repair. It's not perfect, because you end up with more machines to look after. Um, and taking a traditional SUSE distro, especially one with like recommends enabled, and then trying to minimize it down to something that works is a ton of effort. And then, you know, healing and repairing a whole bunch of machines all at scale is, you know, more complex and more costly. Which is, I guess, why there is this whole premise of you know, never touching the running system. When I was a sysadmin, I did my best to actually never touch a running system. You, know, you can't break it if you don't touch it, and most of it. You know, and if you do touch it, you touch it in some defined maintenance window. You know, some nice time box where if it does go wrong, it's not going to be the end of the world. Your users aren't all going to suffer. You know, you've got your best engineers on site and ready for that. So yeah, the impact is all minimized when it goes horribly wrong. But you've still got downsides with that. I mean, you know, the best time to do maintenance is probably not the best time for your sysadmin to want to be up in the morning. You know, it's, they're very rarely do those, those things overlap. You know? And if you're patching a system but then not actually rebooting it or not going through and restarting all the services, you know, you're in some weird, inconsistent, insecure state or not quite a secure state. And of course, if you're not patching it at all, you're definitely in an insecure state up until that maintenance window. So, you know, lots of people just throw more and more servers at the problem, you know, clustering, Kubernetes, salt, whatever, like have automation, have more machines, orchestrate everything, you know, have duplication so you can take one node down while you're working on another, you know, it does keep the impact of outages minimal, it does also keep the impact of, of maintenance minimal, you know, you can quite often do half of the maintenance without any of the impact. When it does go wrong, your time to recover is improved, doesn't most of the time. And you need less humans to look after more and more machines, which is good because we're making more and more machines. So, you know, it's just basic common sense. Using automation is a, a good thing as these things grow. But if the automation is nice and complex, then congratulations, you've just introduced a whole new way for everything to break all in one go. So it's, it's not a panacea, it's not perfect. So, immutability. Um, I talked about this in one of my earlier talks this week already. You know, I think the goal of any operating system should just be something that just works. You know, it shouldn't need to have complicated policies and procedures and operating guidelines of, of how to do it. Those best practices should be how the operating system is baked out of the box. That should be the default settings, right? If the best way of handling a Linux machine is only, to, only having it update in the maintenance window, then build a Linux that only updates during a maintenance window, right? Like, that's, take that as standard, run with those ideas, and then do your best to mitigate any of the remaining rough edges. So, taking all of those trends I was talking about earlier, you know, the perfect Linux should be optimized for being single-purpose machines with minimized services, having an update stack that never impacts the running system, should be focusing on self-healing instead of manually repairing. Should be easy to use at scale, but shouldn't need to be used at scale. Like you shouldn't need to have to have automation or Kubernetes because you know if you don't need it, you don't want to be adding that extra complexity to the whole thing. And it should avoid you know needing manual maintenance, ever operating under an inconsistent or unknown state. And like, like I already said, you know, it shouldn't need that orchestration, but it should be ready for it. 
And in the SUSE world, we're already kind of, kind of there. You know, when it comes to the server side of things, the SUSE Linux Enterprise Micro, it's there, it does that job. It is the trim, tuned up, edge ready, VM container, ed yeah, edge host, it does, does a bit of everything. Same with micro OS, but on the community side, as a rolling release. And of course, between this is Leap Micro, which of course is just a community copy of Flea Micro. And then even on the desktop side, there is now Aeon. And all of these have fully automatic updates. The OS is never updating during the runtime. You know, transactional update does everything at the side. No libraries changing, no binaries changing. The OS is always in a perfectly known state. All of these are designed to do just one job, although the job is sometimes different. The footprint is minimized, and they're all ready for orchestration or automation of some kind. So there's been a ton of talks about transactional update, but I didn't, so didn't want to go into like huge, massive detail of how it works. But you know, in a nutshell, it's taking the PTIFS snapshotting that we all know and love from SUSE distros for like forever, and kind of flips it around on its head. Rather than taking a snapshot of the running system and then having the update happen and then taking a snapshot afterwards, with the idea basically being to have point in time views of you know, what the heck was going on because you're touching the running system. So we need to worry about everything you know, at both ends of it. Transactional update takes a BTFS snapshot of, yeah, of the system and all of the changes to the system happen in that snapshot. So the running system never gets touched at all. That's still read only. But all of the updates happen in a new BTFS snapshot all in, all in one consistent mess. So all those RPM scripts can do whatever the heck they want, but they ain't touching your running system. Um, that also means we can then check the sanity of what the heck is RPM done in that snapshot. You know, did every script run properly? Is everything consistent? Does it look good? If it does, that BTFS snapshot is then marked to be the next boot target, hence needing to reboot. But the nice result of that is the entire process is utterly atomic. You know, you go from one exact state of a system to the new state in one single reboot. The whole thing is entirely applied, or if something goes wrong, that entire snapshot is thrown away. No problem. Like I said, all without running, all without impacting the running system. By default, this all happens fully automated. It takes the, the update step takes place between midnight and 2 a.m., but you can change that. That's just a system D timer. Cool, thank you. Um, all within two hours of the latest boot. So it's a persistent timer. So if the system is down, like you're using a laptop or something, it'll do the background update within two hours of booting back up again. And then depending on which distro we're talking about, you know, either in the case of Aeon, where there's a desktop, so we're expecting a human to be there, it notifies the user that they can reboot the machine whenever they want. In the servers, we're talking typically about Reboot Manager or Kubernetes, basically informing some daemon which then has the maintenance window controlled in it, which actually, yeah, is the sole and single job of Reboot Manager to basically say, you know, the maintenance window for this machine is X, whatever that is. So then if there's an update, when X comes along, boop, server reboots. Reboots only happen then. So you can actually queue up a bunch of different updates if you don't have, yeah, don't have a maintenance window that often, but as soon as it comes along, the machine reboots. In the Kubernetes world, you'll probably use something like the Kubernetes reboot daemon and have your Kubernetes cluster not do this job instead, and then restart the machines as they're ready. We have Health Checker, which basically checks for errors during the boot phase, does a combination of checking system D services that it cares about, and did these system D services all start properly, and if not, roll back or, and running plugin scripts to actually do sort of deeper dives into the system. Um, yeah, you know, is this service actually responding to this command the right way that it should be, et cetera, et cetera. Any of those services fail, any of those plugins fail, the entire snapshot is thrown away and back to how it should be. Unless it worked the first time. Like, if you've had an update and it worked perfectly fine, and then you're rebooting again for some other reason, but it, kind of it's being a bit flaky and misbehaving on the second reboot without a change. And then Health Checker assumes that, you know, it knows it was good in the past, so it assumes you just have a flaky service. 
So it tries to kind of act like a, like a bit of a sysadmin, and it will just reboot a couple of times and see if the problem goes away, uh, which is a neat trick, because what's the point of rolling back if we know it worked in the past? Typically, given that you're probably only rebooting when there's updates anyway, that doesn't really come up that often, but it's kind of fun to see when it does. With transactional updates, like I say, the typical use case would be just using it for the update stack. That's why it's called what it is. Um, but you can, of course, also use it for changing the base OS of your immutable distro, yeah, however you'd like. So you can add or move packages using transactional update PKG in foo. PKG, the transactional update PKG is basically just a wrapper for zipper, so you can pretty much use any zipper command after that. Um, that's great. There is, of course, things that you might want to change in the base OS that isn't the command you can map with zipper. So then, you know, complicated scripts, third-party apps, you know, that kind of thing. You've got transactional update run. You run the command. The command will then run in that snapshot, change your system, and then be ready for when that reboot happens. That's great. Just, of course, obvious disclaimer, if you're messing with the base system, you're messing with the base system. It might not be as yeah, exactly working the same way that everybody else's micro OS or sleep micro is set up to work. But if that's true and you know it's misbehaving and not behaving the way it should be, and for whatever reason health checker isn't noticing it, you can roll back yourself just like you can on a traditional SUSE distro. We don't use Snapper to roll back because the way the configs are arranged on transactional systems is a little more complicated. Although I imagine that's going to change, actually. Cool. So this will soon be out of date. But at the moment, to do a rollback. Already? OK, awesome. So you can roll back with transactional update, roll back last. Or Ignaz has already fixed it, so you can just use Snapper to roll back now as well. So that's cool. That's brilliant. Um, so yeah, then that makes more sense. Then you can have Snapper list to list all the snapshots if you want to be picky about one. And you can roll back either with transactional update or snapper. So, you know, you're using one of these OSs. It's not a traditional Linux. You know, it's approaching these things a little bit differently. What does that really mean when it comes to running stuff on top? The best advice would be, you know, the, all these immutable Linuxes work best when services are somewhat abstracted from the base OS. That can mean containers. That can mean VMs. On, Desktops that can mean flat pack apps. You know, the basic idea being, you know, if your application or your workload is being, you know, is not part of the base OS, the base OS can go and do its, its thing, and you can worry about the application separately and update that at whatever cadence or whatever standard makes sense for that. And also it means, you know, you can update your container without needing to reboot the whole system. You know, it's a good it's a good way of working. And so, yeah, my daily life with Immutable Linux, I, I'm not, I don't need to think like a sysadmin on a daily basis anymore. You know, I've, I've actually got a micro OS server that has been running uninterrupted without any major drama since September 30th, 2018, which is really impressive because we didn't actually release micro OS until 2019. <laughs> Um, so this was like a prototype machine that was like super early before we had you know the whole concept baked to whatever. That box is still sitting there, running, updating. I, I maybe log into it like two times a year. It, it really does not need much love or attention at all. But it does like that runs my life. Every container, every service in my life is all running on there. Um, in the SUSE world, we're seeing more and more customers going down this road too and doing these kind of things in data centers and factories and like putting it on boats that don't ever see any network connection for like six months and then need to suddenly update everything while they're in some harbor with some lousy network connection. And I'm doing my best to bring all of this also to the desktop world, hence building Aeon, which I talked about yesterday. So I think I've got five minutes left for Q&A. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, there's a microphone at the back. Hello. Hello. Hi. This is more a remark, really. Um, there's this, I'm running a container host, and I just don't think it needs to be updated daily. So I 
just want to say that you can actually edit the transactional minus update or timer to run weekly or however often you want. And Absolutely. Change like, it. <laughs> I totally agree. You know, the, the, I think it makes sense to have the default being daily, personally, but I'm perfectly fine with people changing that timer to whatever cadence fits them. Yeah, mine is set to a weekly now, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Hi, I, I have a different question because my usual problem with uh, BitRFS is that it uh, runs out of the space. And uh, if uh, the transactional update can handle it, that uh, it tries to update, it uh, eats all the space, and if it uh, basically scratches the snapshot so it doesn't eat the space, or if it's somehow handled or not. Well, we don't. We typically don't run out of space in this day and age with Q groups enabled and you know snapper cleaning up based on storage use and that kind of thing. So that problem is kind of mitigated elsewhere. But yeah, if the if the if the transactional update runs out of space while it's happening, you know, that's gonna be one of those examples where the snapshot never gets completed, so transactional update would throw the snapshot away and it, it never happened. Um, so yeah. Yeah, good. And uh, second question you mentioned uh, with Elon that uh, you inform user about need of a reboot. And uh, yeah, my question is if user can uh, somehow cancel that update because that always annoys me at Windows that it starts always updating when it's yeah the worst time ever. So if I can stop the update <laughs> in Elon, yeah. So the fun thing, and it's funny actually, because another presentation um, that someone else gave actually has a clip from that uh, Netflix TV show Space Force where like that Windows update interrupting everything is a plot point. Um, all these updates all happen in the background, so the user never sees them. It never affects the running system. It doesn't, you know, doesn't pop anything up while it's doing anything. So. It's it, the only thing that you know could possibly annoy you is once a day you get a pop up from GNOME saying there was an update ready in the background. Yeah, I have different issue because usually for me it happens during some video call and I have limited bandwidth. So <laughs> so basically update start yeah killing network and that's yeah yeah that's for me the worst time. Yeah. So you well you can change the again like Tamara said you can change the timer right so you know change the timer so the updates only happen in certain time windows. Um, there are also discussions of like having, yeah, having the update be more aware about things like the network condition. You know, are you on a metered network connection? Don't do the update, um, stuff like that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Richard. Hi, Oli. Um, we recently had an incident on a, call it legacy system, so it's not an immutable system. It's an open case UCDE the instance. And the problem was that on reboot, which we do regularly also after updates, so it's not really related to what was included in the update, but as can happen, file system checks were scheduled. And it happened that multiple file system uh, checks were scheduled at the same time for multi-terabyte XFS file systems, and then XFS was running out of memory, and then the system didn't come up. I assume so far transactional updates wouldn't really have helped, but maybe there's something for the future to consider? Yeah, I mean, in that case, it wouldn't have helped, apart from, like, typically when you start going down this road, you kind of just end up using ButterFS for everything. And then you don't have XFS doing stuff like eating all your memory. So, uh, yeah. But that's just, that's a purely like luck suggest, yeah, reaction. Right. But, yeah. Well, I haven't considered that, but good answer, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then, oh, one more question. Sorry. Hi, uh, since I host a lot of uh, micro OS VMs, I would ask a question about Reboot Manager. Is there a way to ensure that only one VM is getting reboot in a single time? So I don't want, I want to eliminate the possibility of having every single virtual machine try to reboot at the same time. The easiest way of handling that in Reboot Manager would be having different maintenance windows for each VM and not all having them at the same time, because they're all hit the same time at the same time. Time is constant in that way. Um, yeah, and that, that avoids that problem. Um, in a Kubernetes cluster, that's what like the Kubernetes reboot daemon does, is stops that. But 
Um, I mean, I guess we could think of putting some demon in a, VM, in a hypervisor and looking at that. SCD, yeah, exactly. That, yeah. Using something like SCD might be a, a route for that, and there is support for transactional update to listen to what an SCD server tells it to do. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference.